Four years after Guttmacher made that statement, America's National Security Council issued a report that was intended to define the United States government's official policy on controlling world population. It was called the National Security Study Memorandum 200, or NSSM 200, and it was formulated in cooperation with the United States Agency for International Development, the U.S. State Department, the Department of Defense, and the Central Intelligence Agency. One of its goals was to establish a strategy for reducing the populations of third world countries so that the United States could have increased access to their natural resources, particularly minerals and metals. Among the conclusions of NSSM 200 was that no country has reduced its population growth without resorting to abortion. The authors of the report then identified three non-governmental agencies that would be funded to carry out the government's population control agenda in the targeted countries. One of those agencies was Planned Parenthood. One of the tactics specified in NSSM 200 was that we might withhold food aid after a disaster if the countries do not accept the American idea of birth control. And this has happened many times all over the world. One example is the uh, southern American country of Guyana, which was hit by a hurricane back in 1997. Now, they had turned down abortion and birth control for 12 years straight. But after the hurricane hit Guyana in 1997, the World Bank said, we will not give you any aid unless you legalize abortion and birth control. And that's exactly what they did. I've seen this several times in Africa, where droughts have hit, and the United Nations and USAID will not assist unless they accept birth control. I've been all through Africa myself, and I've seen medical clinics that are full of birth control devices, but no safe motherhood delivery kits. There's no uh, anesthesia, there's not even any bandages there. There's crates and crates of birth control bills and condoms. Now, while our commitment to birth control is going up every year, our commitment to authentic economic development is dropping. So we see less uh, clean drinking water funding, uh, less school funding, uh, see less medical clinic funding. Another example is Haiti. Uh, Haiti has been hit by hurricanes several times, and uh, the United States and other countries are saturated with birth control. In Haiti now, any woman, 90% of women at least, can now get access to any kind of birth control they want to, government funded, but less than 20% of the Haitians have access to clean drinking water. Now try to imagine there being a natural catastrophe in a country like Canada or Australia or France or England. And we go in there and we say to them, we're not going to offer you any kind of aid unless you accept our philosophy on birth control and population control. That will be outrageous. But that's our standard operating procedure when we go to a black country after a catastrophe of some kind. You cannot believe that we are going to treat people in a foreign country like this and not treat our own population of African Americans the same way. Consider what happened after Hurricane Katrina. One of the first things we did was bring in birth control and contraception. And as we all know, the hurricane disproportionately affected black families in that area. And I seriously doubt if the same kind of disaster hit a middle-class white area, the first response would be condoms and birth control. This idea that population control could be used to control a specific population was not unique to NSSM 200. For example, before the Nazis took power in Germany, abortion had been illegal except to save the life of the mother. But under Hitler, the Hamburg Eugenics Court ruled that it would still be illegal for Aryan women, but legal for women of what they called inferior racial stock. According to the court, encouraging eugenic abortions would promote racial hygiene and protect the health of the German people. This new policy eventually led to certain women being threatened with execution if they refused to abort what the Nazis called racially worthless babies. At about the same time this was going on in Germany, the government of Bermuda was blanketing the island with population control facilities and openly stating that their intent was to limit the numbers of blacks. Then in 1958, blacks in the Caribbean rebelled against a Planned Parenthood-led birth control campaign that was exclusively targeted at non-white residents, while at the same time, prosperous white residents were being encouraged to multiply. Following a similar pattern, a 1965 article in the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper reported that under apartheid, the white South African government was relying on targeted birth control as its primary weapon to reduce the number of blacks in the country. 
Unfortunately, we now know that the U.S. government was not immune to this sort of thing either. When three pro-choice researchers investigated the original motive behind the creation of the abortion pill, RU486, what they discovered was that the scientific basis for it was actually developed in the United States during the 1960s by the National Institutes of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In their 1991 book, these researchers claimed to have found data showing that this agency was looking for an inexpensive and effective drug to control the populations of foreign countries that the government had classified as underdeveloped. The abortion pill was to be tested in these environments and, if successful, the plan called for it to then be introduced into black, Hispanic, and Native American communities in the United States. In 1977, only three years after NSSM 200 was issued, the director of the United States Office of Population, Dr. Reimert T. Ravenholt, publicly stated that it was the U.S. government's intention to sterilize one-fourth of the world's female population. According to Ravenholt, one of the driving forces behind this campaign was the need to protect American financial and commercial interests. Ravenholt said that some foreign governments were refusing to give the United States permission to come into their country and control their population. He said that, in those cases, the plan was to be carried out by two private organizations with an enormous amount of financial support from the American government. When asked by a St. Louis newspaper to name the two organizations, he said that they were the United Nations Fund for Population Activities and Planned Parenthood. Among government officials who supported the Ravenholt philosophy of using American intervention to control the populations of foreign countries, perhaps the most powerful were Republican President Gerald Ford, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. In the mid-1970s, while serving as foreign policy advisor to the Ford-Rockefeller administration, Kissinger personally helped Planned Parenthood set up an abortion counseling program for Vietnam refugees who were being housed at Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base in California. This was done despite the fact that the vast majority of these refugees were known to be strongly opposed to abortion, and not one of them had ever requested abortion counseling. At the same time, Kissinger also refused to hold an abortion training program that was being conducted by the Agency for International Development, which operates under the direction of the State Department. Kissinger allowed this project to continue despite numerous complaints that it was in clear violation of U.S. law that specifically prohibited American foreign aid funds from being used for this purpose. The commitment that Ford, Rockefeller, and Kissinger had for this illegal project may have been a reaction to something Reimart Ravenholt had said a few years earlier. In 1973, he was speaking at a Planned Parenthood national conference where he told attendees that abortion may actually be the most demographically powerful way of controlling population. Ravenholt would eventually be honored by Planned Parenthood for what it called innovation and vision in the population field. Years ago, a series of USA Today articles documented that there are large multinational corporations on the New York Stock Exchange today that actually got their start in the slave trade. But when slavery ended, and Africans could no longer be financially exploited, many of those same corporations began pouring millions into the eugenics movement. The people they had found so valuable as property, they had little use for as fellow citizens. And again, some of those corporations and foundations and institutions are still around today, and every year they still pour millions into eugenics organizations like Planned Parenthood. In fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood's donor list, it reads like a who's who of corporate America. You also have individual elitists doing the exact same thing. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett, Ted Turner, and many others have used their own personal fortunes to make sure that the eugenics movement never runs short of money. Of course, if you confront these people or these corporations about their support for organizations like Planned Parenthood, They'll tell you it has nothing to do with eugenics. And if someone is naive enough to believe that, that's fine. But to me, it's like someone saying, yeah, I give a few million dollars a year to the Klan, but I'm not really a racist. 
After the abortion pill RU486 was approved for sale in the U.S., the controversy surrounding it kept the abortion lobby from being able to find an American company to produce it. That forced them to look for a foreign manufacturer. And after an eight-year search, a company owned by the Chinese government agreed to manufacture the drug for the U.S. market. The company's management made the decision after the Rockefeller Foundation agreed to provide financial backing for the project. There's also another connection between Rockefeller and RU486.